Okay, um, I think we'll get started. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us for our last session of Scholar Talks. Here um, to uh, lead our scholars uh, through those talks is, uh, again, Ms. Monica Soriano. She's the Navy Component Liaison. Monica, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Brandon? I'm great. Over to you. Thank you. Um, well, afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, as Brandon said, my name is Monica and I am the Naval uh, Component Liaison. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce the final round of technical talks. Um, so this afternoon session will be focused on AI, autonomy, and advanced software and computing. Um, for this afternoon, we have four excellent presentations for you. Um, and any questions that you may have for the presenters, please go ahead um, and put them in the chat. Um, and if time permits, at the end of each presentation, we will pose those questions um, to the presenters and any questions that we're not able to get to, because if there's a time constraint, um, we'll be able to answer those um, in the Whova app. They can be moved to the community board. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started with our first presenter. Um, our first presenter is uh, Julia Haynes. Um, she is at HQ Air Force Material Command Analysis and Assessment, um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, and her project title is Linguistics Analysis in the Air Force Context. All right, Julia, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to tune in. Uh, I'm Julia Haynes. I work for HQ Air Force Materiel Command stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base here in Dayton, Ohio. Um, I, was, I was selected for the SMART program when I was a freshman in college, so I did the three-year program with two internships um, for my undergrad degree. Um, I went to Wake Forest University, and I got two degrees in statistics and computer science. Um, sorry. And uh, the SMART program was for the statistics one and then the computer science, I just uh, couldn't let go. So I did both. <laughs> um, but then I started working here in Dayton um, in the fall of 2019. So I've been here for about three years now um, with my sponsoring facility. And I had done two internships with them in the fall or in the summer of 2018 and 2017. So once I started here, my office was great and they supported me um, going to get my master's in operations research from the Air Force Institute of Technology, which is also here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, so that was a really cool experience. And I got to kind of be one of the only civilians sitting in a class full of active duty ops research people. So that was really fascinating and definitely a different side of statistics than I had seen before. Um, so I'll go ahead and start my presentation here. I'll see if I can just get rid of that. All right. Um, so while I work for HQ AFMC, um, my branch is basically the studies and analysis branch. So we are just an office of about 20 um, operations research analysts, and we do projects for the entire command. Um, so if anybody in LCMC has needs help with a project or AFRL needs help with a project, um, we kind of have hands in a lot of those pots because we're kind of um, not contractors, obviously, but people can kind of borrow us for one-off projects here and there, which means that my office has given me the chance to have a wide range of projects and a lot of experience in different kind of types of ops research analysis. Um, so that's why I have the logo for AFMC and my studies and analysis branch down here. Um, so in that vein, I am matrix part-time to the 7-11th human performance wing over at AFRL. Um, and with them, I'm doing a project that does a lot of AI ML type stuff. Um, and then my text analysis kind of projects are more with HQ AFMC. So I'll get into a little bit more of where we sit and what kind of projects I've been able to work, work on um, thanks to where I've been placed in the SMART program. Okay. Um, so, like I said, my sponsoring facility is HQAFMC. Um, so, A9A is kind of the programs and plans directorate. Um, so, we are kind of important to like helping the AFMC CD or any of the um, AFMC A1, AFMC A4, kind of um, any office that's kind of tangential to HQ AFMC, we help them with any of their analysis. Um, so, A1 projects are usually like uh, personnel type projects. So we help with uh, diversity and analysis projects. We help with um, retention or hiring practices or awards analysis. And we do a lot of that kind of stuff with A1. 
Um, with A4, we help with some CAM budgeting, kind of cost analysis, uh, return on investment analysis, kind of stuff like that. Um, and then we also do kind of ad hoc projects with like A3 if they ask or A6. Um, so we kind of have hands in a lot of different pots. Um, but I just had a few of the different project categories that we typically touch listed here. Um, some people in my office also do wargaming support. That's something that I'm currently moving into and I'm excited about learning more. Um, and we do a lot of survey analysis. So if you guys have taken um, like the FEVS survey lately or DOX, if you're in the Air Force or OPM surveys, any kind of survey that's asking you about, like, do you like your job? Why do you like your job? Or, you know, what do you have to say um, with that? And I, I realized when I had first started that a lot of those project requests were coming in and a lot of that open-ended text data that you get from those open-ended questions was kind of being pushed to the wayside um, just because it's difficult to quantify like, okay, three people said that they didn't like their boss, but in order to say that, you would have had to read through a hundred comments and manually count those three. Um, so I built a text analysis tool that essentially automates that and saves us a little bit of time um, so that we can quantitatively say, you know, three people mentioned their boss and used positive versus negative adjectives and do a little bit of sentiment analysis and topic modeling just to automate that process and save ops research analysts like myself um, hundreds of hours of reading through, you know, people saying that they don't like their job and why. Um, so I'll go here and explain a little bit more about kind of the technical expertise that we use for those. Um, so with the linguistic analysis, that's kind of what we apply to some of those survey questions. Um, when I did my master's at AFIT, I wrote my thesis on sentiment analysis specifically for the Air Force context. Um, so to give that a little bit more background, essentially most sentiment analysis applications fall into AI ML type things um, and so do topic modeling. So it's essentially when you take a big piece of text and you're trying to figure out what somebody was saying um, and if they were saying something positive or negative about what. Um, and a lot of those are trained to be applied to kind of Amazon reviews, like Amazon product reviews. So you might say um, somebody doesn't like this shirt because the fit is wrong or the fat, like the fabric is wrong or something like that. So you might want to, you know, take a ton of those comments if you're doing analysis on that t-shirt brand and say like, okay, people tend to really like the fabric, but they really hate the fit. So maybe we need to adjust our sizing. Um, what's easy about doing that with Amazon reviews is that it's usually associated with, um, you know, one to three stars or one to five stars. And then you can associate it with exactly the sentiment of what they were saying, if they gave it a negative or a positive review, but we don't necessarily have stars that we associate with open-ended questions from Air Force surveys. So that's why we have to apply AI, AI ML techniques to kind of quantify some of that text data. Um, and in the Air Force context specifically, with like the, the word warfighter, that's not necessarily a negative word, but outside of the Air Force context, it, it might be because the word fight is in there and the word war is in there. And um, so that's why we kind of need to adopt some sentiment analysis techniques specifically for the Air Force or DOD context. Um, so I built an R Shiny app. I called it SLANG. Um, it's a, an acronym. It's called a Survey Linguistic Analysis Knowledge Guide. Um, and it's essentially just an R Shiny app that I built that does a little bit of that AIML technique to pull out the sentiment and the topics from a large piece of text. Usually that's applied to survey data, but it's grown pretty fast and I've had customers come to me and ask for it um, to be applied to a variety of different topics as well. Um, outside of that project, I've been able to use some random forest techniques and some other AI ML kind of things with um, my project with the 7-11th Human Performance Wing at AFRL. Um, so essentially that project is looking at trying to quantify the mental health risk scores of units across the Air Force, specifically active duty units that have more than 30 people in them. Um, and that's just to protect the privacy of individuals because we, when we were doing all of our modeling, we didn't want one individual to drive the risk score of a unit and be singled out. Um, so that project has been really, really fascinating and very cool because I've been able to use a lot of the techniques that I learned in my master's degree and in my undergrad degree um, and code those in R, um, which is the primary tool I've been using for that. 
Um, so that's been really, really cool um, to be able to kind of train that classifier and be able to kind of work out which units have higher risk scores than others, especially because I have a lot of faith in the team and the team is great. And it's not just going nowhere um, because mental health providers and teams of like therapists, psychology, psychologists, um, physical therapists are at in each installation and they use those risk scores to decide which units to do embedments with and which units to go to and say like, okay, we see that you guys might have a problem. What can we do to intervene? What can we do to improve your quality of life? And how? And then on the back end, how does that impact the mission or your ability to do the job, readiness data? Um, so that that project has been super fascinating and I'm very grateful to work with that team over there as well. Um, and where we sit with HQAFMC gives me the chance to kind of have a hand in that pot, also do work with survey analysis at the HQAFMC level. Um, and then I've also done a few kind of just tool development, software development type projects with AFMC CDX. Um, they do a lot of the survey analysis for AFMC We Need, which was an initiative that they kicked off about two years ago, I think, um, where they were asking people kind of what they wanted to see in the command, what they didn't want to see in the command, and that going straight up to the commander and him being able to have that flexibility to kind of quickly respond to those requests from the people. Um, I also had put RAND on here because when I first started, I was in charge of collecting uh, study topic ideas for RAND Project Air Force. Um, essentially, that's a line item in the Air Force budget where every single year RAND as the corporation is contracted to do a ton of different studies on behalf of the Air Force. Um, and there is a giant selection process that goes into deciding which studies um, or which study topics are worthy of being allocated that funding. Um, so that was also kind of a cool way that I was able to kind of see where everybody sat, um, how everybody contributes to the same mission, um, not necessarily an ops research project or an AIML project, but still very cool to see those study topics roll in and see what people were requesting um, from across AFMC. Um, especially when you could see, you know, somebody from this organization is requesting the same study as somebody from this other organization. Let me put them in touch so that we can prevent some um, stovepiping and stuff like that. Okay, so this is just a little bit more of an overview of the SLING tool that I built, um, which is the linguistic analysis that I do with the Air Force. Um, essentially, I made this because I saw that we were getting a ton more survey requests, a ton more surveys, and I didn't like seeing kind of the open-ended text data being thrown to the wayside because in my head, that not only degrades the um, confidence that you have in when you take surveys, um, but it also, somebody took the time to write out exactly why they were feeling what they were feeling um, and kind of give a little backstory to whatever Likert scale they answered earlier in the survey. So I didn't want that to just get kind of thrown to the side or just used for poll quotes. Um, so essentially I translate those into not only word clouds, but also kind of sentiment analysis and topic modeling. So here you can see um, I broke down a survey that was asking about telework into negative, positive, and neutral comments. Um, and then this was kind of a topic modeling as well. Um, for the topic modeling, sometimes we're able to use um, LDA, latent dialect analysis, um, just to kind of algorithmically identify which topics people are talking about. Um, but a lot of the time, just because of the context of this survey data that we work with, the topics overlap so much um, that I instead allow the user to define topics based on keywords, um, because then they're able to kind of identify if somebody says that they don't like their supervisor because their supervisor is not good at being accessible over telework, is that a supervisor topic? Is that a telework topic? Or is that a communication topic? Um, so it's very, all of those topics kind of overlap. So instead I just gave the user that autonomy to be able to decide where they wanted that to fall or if they wanted it to fall into multiple categories. So it just saves the an analysts some time. <laughs> Um, so I've had a really good experience with the SMART program. Um, I enjoy my office a lot and I enjoy the projects that I'm able to work on. Um, I feel like I'm given the chance to make a little bit of a difference, which is really all I ask for. Um, so I had done my two internships with Dayton um, or with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base here in Dayton, Ohio. I'm originally from North Carolina. My family's in North Carolina and I 
uh, couldn't have told you five years ago that I was going to be moving to Dayton, Ohio, but um, it's really, it's really a great base to work at. Um, it's kind of almost feels like a college campus in the city because everybody works for the base in some capacity um, that you run into on a day-to-day basis. And so um, there's just a good community of collaboration out here. Um, and I would definitely recommend the area to anyone kind of considering it, even if it feels like you would be um, accepting something in the middle of Ohio, even if you've never lived in Ohio, um, I would definitely recommend it. Um, and then I've had a good experience with mentoring as well. The, this space is a little bit older than most spaces, which means that there's a lot of mentoring opportunities, not only to be mentored, but also to mentor incoming people, incoming civilians, um, not only in the SMART program, but also in the Palace Acquire program. Um, and then I've also had the chance to go TDY to several other bases, um, including Whiteman and um, Quantico and, you know, just all over the place. So that's been really neat as well to be able to kind of network and meet people who work all, all over the place. Um, and then my final point here was just that um, they do base analyst Frisbee twice a week here at Wright Pat. Um, I love Frisbee. I think it's super fun and they do it on the flight line. So that's like right next to where the planes are kind of taking off and landing, especially on Tuesdays. Um, and that has been recently expanded to not only the analyst community, but also just the wider base community here. So that's always a really fun way to kind of run circles around each other and um, network without necessarily networking. So um, I've enjoyed my time with SMART and I'm super thankful to the program for accepting me in the first place. Um, my commitment will be over in a few months here. So I'm almost done with uh, phase two and then I'll transition into phase three. Excellent. Thank you, Julia. That was really interesting and really, really neat um, technology. Um, we do have one quick question that I think we have time for. Um, where do you host your app slang for others to use? Yeah, so I have been working to try to get it hosted on um, the Vault platform, which is um, accessible to Air Force analyst community. But the problem with that is that there's a little bit of a data concern um, where if somebody used it while it was in the vault, then the da their data is not necessarily protected. So I usually just email it out to people. Um, but I recently presented the Slang app at the Military Ops Research Symposium, um, which was in Quantico last month. Um, and I was it was recommended that I host it on uh, Git GitHub. <laughs> GitHub, sorry. Um, so I think I'm going to put it there as well. But if um, anybody wants a demo or wants me to email it to you, um, just reach out and I'm happy to share it. Excellent. Thank you. That was really good. Um, okay, um, let's move on um, to the next presenter. Um, so our next presenter is Dr. Rachel Kennard. Um, she is at Air Force uh, Research Laboratory Sensors Direct at Wright-Patterson um, Air Force Base. Um, and Dr. Kennard's um, project title is Leading in 2020 with Robust um, CAD. So Rachel, you can begin. Awesome. Let me do a quick comms check. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. All right. My camera's out of commission. Of course, the day of a, a conference, we're going to have a base-wide internet hiccup. So, you know, we kind of had to transition really quickly, um, but we're really good at being flexible. It's one of the things that, that we do in the Air Force. Um, my name is Dr. Rachel Kiner. Um, I'm an, a research mathematician here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base working for the Air Force Research Lab. And you've seen a lot of presence from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in a lot of these talks. And at least for the Air Force Research Lab, that's because at least five of the nine directorates have a presence here at Wright-Patterson. So, you know, you get a lot of representation from a lot of different parts of the Air Force community here at this base. It's a very large base. It's an exciting place to work. Um, I have a PhD in pure mathematics, actually in algebraic topology, which is the math studying properties of shapes, deep inherent properties of shapes. And I got my PhD from Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. So it's, a, it's definitely been a move coming to Ohio and like Julia said, you know, you wouldn't think there's much in the middle of Ohio, but it really is a fantastic research community and a great place to be. I have a different SMART story than a lot of other people. I started the SMART program at the very end of my educational experience. I had two years left in my PhD um, when I started the SMART program. So I had a lot of background coming into it. And I would like to speak to some of that at the end. But let's just go ahead and get into what our sponsoring facility does. Um, my sponsoring facility um, is the Sensors Directorate of the Air Force Research Lab specifically the multi-domain sensing autonomy decision sciences. Um, our 
our branch focuses not just on sensors, but on sensing and sense making what we do with that data that comes off of sensors and how we can parse it and analyze it and use it to make rapid, effective, intelligent decisions. Um, so that, that information that comes in is multi-domain. It comes from a lot of different sources um, and it's collected in active and inactive environments, um, whether it's, it's an actual field tool or whether it's just for um, analyzing a, a particular a location or gathering a certain amount of data. Um, but in addition to this measured data that we gather off the sensors, we also generate a certain amount of synthetic data um, to test our, and predict, make predictions on our automatic target recognition algorithms. So to get into a little bit of that, um, the field of artificial intelligence right now, machine learning, is at the forefront. And machine learning, if you're not familiar with it, is very data hungry. You feed a lot of data into an algorithm and that algorithm learns a pattern off of that data and then uses it to apply to new data. And we use that for ATR specifically for um, detection of objects, object detection, classification, trying to decide what we're looking at and what, what class it fits into, and also tracking, um, following an object or maintaining custody on an object. So like I said, that those ATR algorithms are really data hungry. We're talking about huge amounts of data and we like to take that data straight from the field, from our measured data, from our physical experiments, from actual things that are happening. And that's very high accuracy, but to set up a data collection in that modality is very expensive, both in terms of money, um, in coordination and in field hours, getting just the right data for exactly the target you need to train on. So a lot of uh, movement has been involved in generating synthetic data these computer simulations that produce the data we would like to see in the field. But the problem is there's a very large gap. It's called the measured to synthetic data gap. And it is a real problem um, trying to generate the type of synthetic data that matches and correctly matches that measured data. Um, for example, training on this synthetic data to say, here's an object, can you recognize this? And then bringing that sensor out into the field and trying to get it to recognize that object can be very difficult. And your accuracy is truly limited by a bunch of factors, most importantly being your model, the model you're using, which is a CAD model. Um, CAD stands for computer-aided design, but it's, it's kind of misused to say computer model. Um, and the simulation and software you use also affects the quality of your synthetic data. But the good part is that it's inexpensive. It's quick and easy to generate. And when you're talking about a rapid de decision-making space where you have to make these decisions quickly and effectively with high accuracy, you wanna be able to generate data quickly. Um, but the third kind of like awkward cousin that lives between measures and synthetic is the scale model data, um, where you're actually physically simulating something in a laboratory environment and then making adjustments to your measurements based on the scale you're working. And that involves a lot of mathematics and engineering. They play back and forth really well um, between each other. And again, that's inexpensive in terms of processing hours, but limited by, again, the accuracy of your model and your manufacturing process. Now I get to see a large part of this um, area. You kind of notice there's a bit of a miss. So I've got a PhD in pure mathematics, but yet here we're talking about CAD, computer aided design and scale modeling. Well, my background before I went to grad school for mathematics was I, had, I got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and I worked as a CAD drafter in the heart of the oil field. So you're talking drafting tanks and pumps. Tanks is in the storage tanks, not the military kind. And you know now the shift is definitely to the military kind of things. But yeah, so I, I've seen a lot of the broad range of practical applications all the way up to really heavy theory. And the sweet spot between those two areas is truly in this computer modeling um, area where you can bring in the rigor of mathematical applications and then take that model and apply it to something um, in the mechanical engineering or engineering world. Okay, so the inputs, like I mentioned, are, are multi-domain. We're getting EO data off of these electro-optical sensors IR data, SAR data, there's all these different inputs that are coming into this problem. But what underpins them all is this rigorous model that you're using um, to, to analyze and to, to apply this data to. So the efficient generation of these data models, and, and really key here is these robust models, these models that are gonna stand the test of analysis, um, promotes this agile computation, this ability to pull a model in, run a result really quick and push the data out for useful um, analysis. Now, now, what underpins most of these models is this idea that the models have to be watertight or they have to have no gaps or surface flaws. And that um, robustness of the model is what's going to give you good synthetic um, data that you can use in your machine learning algorithms. 
Okay, so here's a little bit of a visual. You can see here on the right, you've got this CAD model. Again, we're kind of using the word CAD to describe all of these computer simulated models. It's, it's a wild world out there. Um, but the, the mesh that's on top of the model is that, that structure of triangles that makes up the surface of it. And you can see those faces are called facets. Um, some mesh is really well suited to analysis. You can see on the wheels of this model, you've got a nice uniform mesh um, that you can traverse along all of those nodes very quickly, very effectively, and, and compute what you're trying to compute, whatever kind of simulation that you're doing. But you'll notice there on the doors and on the corner of those windshields, you have all these really small slivers of triangles. And that's not necessarily bad, but it can slow down computation a lot. What is bad are these things that I'm listing on the left. Um, when the model is not watertight, it means that you have non-orientable um, surfaces on that model, open edges, holes. And this is really where the mathematics comes behind it. Analyzing what kind of error you have and coming up with a procedure that's going to combat that error in every generalized situation and then applying it to the models that you're working with. So you've got to have that whole range of skills, that, that robust ability to notice these errors, how to fix them, and then actually going about fixing them so you can use them in these simulations. So one of the projects I got to work on as a smart student is to determine and validate this prepare procedure to make these models watertight. So I got this one-on-one -on -one firsthand experience with, with um, repairing these models. Again, I mentioned this is a very engineering versus math solution. You've got the practical, I want to repair the file, I want to turn the file over to an analyst, or maybe I actually want to, like in, the, in this example, 3D print this file. I actually want to manufacture the scale model that came from this file and use it to compare against the data that I'm forming on the computer. But again, you've got this mathematical portion. How can the solution I come up with that works for a particular model be generalized to work for all models in all geometric situations? Um, so the, the, some of the procedures that I came up with involved um, waterfalling multiple um, licensed softwares into each other. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the generalization from this point. But you, know, you start with, with what's state of the art in your field. So for mechanical engineering, you have an, a wide array of CAD softwares, AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Inventor, that you go to as your first line of defense. So you know, OK, I take this model. Um, I put this model through some standard repair software, you know, some things that mechanical engineers are using. And I go through this process of like de-featuring where I take down some of those really tiny features that are getting really messed up. Um, I kind of thicken up particular features that I know are not going to withstand the manufacturing process. And then I go, go about intelligently remeshing the surface of that object before I do a final repair on it. Um, but the problem here is that when you're talking about licensed softwares in the Air Force application, that can get really messy. We, we prefer what we call an open architecture, where we have this modular um, waterfalling of different programs, and we can't get hooked to one particular vendor. So even though AutoCAD is definitely the leader in the field of um, CAD softwares or Inventor or SolidWorks or Pro Engineer, we can't get tied to a particular vendor in the solution. We also can't put that vendor's software on our technology platforms. You know, that would be definitely require some negotiating in terms of contract. So regardless of what the industry is going after, we have to proceed in an open source way or try to find an open source solution to this problem that still encapsulates the, the nature of the solution without actually relying on that, that vendor's software. So um, here you can start to explore some mathematical solutions. What are the underpinnings of those software? What makes them work? And how can I take those principles and apply them without stealing their trade secrets? How can I take those principles and apply them to an open source solution? And you get into a lot of really interesting geometric situations. You get into how can I take this surface area of this object and preserve it? Maybe you have some kind of shrink wrapping algorithm where you, you take that object, you place it inside a gigantic sphere, and you push or project that sphere down onto the surface to try to preserve the mesh. So you get this, this beautiful play interplay between state-of-the-art engineering solutions and open source robust mathematical solutions. And putting the two of those together, you can get something truly beautiful. Um, so when I approached this problem, you know, coming from the engineering side, I saw what the state-of-the-art was there. Coming from the mathematics side, I, I really understood what we needed to, um, to bring together. And I was able to pull together an engineering and mathematics solution that worked, an open source solution um, that pr produced the same result as these um, engineering solutions did. And by doing that, we were able to print a series of scale models that related to targets we were interested in. And the important part about using those scale models versus others that had been generated elsewhere is that they corresponded one-to-one -one with the synthetic data we had already generated. 
They also corresponded one-to-one -to, -one to the measured data that we gathered in the field. So having that one-to-one um, -one matchup, an apples-to-apples -apples type comparison, allows us to correctly augment the measured data that we're gathering in the field with the synthetic data that we're generating. Now, this, this whole problem, why, why did I bring this problem up in particular? I've actually tackled a lot of problems as a smart student, even in my short two years towards the end of my PhD um, of, of becoming a smart scholar. Um, it, this problem in particular illustrates the multidisciplinary nature of a lot of the STEM problems that we get to face in the Air Force, which is something I truly appreciate. Like I could be at a different location working on a math problem, or I could be at a different location working on an engineering problem, but getting the chance to span the entire gambit of your interests and bring to the table each of those skills that you spent time developing is really invaluable. So what the SMART program brought for me was the chance to maintain this active research life in both engineering and mathematics. I can bring both to the table to help solve these relevant problems. It's truly the place where academics meets application. So, you know, working for the Air Force Research Lab has been life-changing for me. I wouldn't trade it for the world. At the beginning of my time as a smart student, I knew nothing about government and getting into the environment and seeing the culture and the ability to move. I think a lot of the speakers this morning were talking about um, the ability to move between different disciplines or in their case, different jobs is really nice. You know, you spend some time working at this problem, you move, you develop and you grow. And that ability to grow is what I really do appreciate the most about my, my um, employment here at Air Force Research Lab. Um, I've had the chance to go to quite, quite a lot of conferences, see a lot of different things, and still probe these two really interesting research areas. So just to reiterate, um, you know, in the Sensors Directorate, we have one mission, but within the other nine directorates of the Air Force Research Lab alone, not, not even to say the larger community outside, we all have a different mission, but we're all going towards the same goal. You know, we do sensing and sense making, we have weapons directorate, you know, we have all of these different uh, research interest groups coming together to solve the same problems. So while we focus on sensor exploitation and this rapid, effective decision making, um, Air Force as a whole focuses in shaping leaders and truly leading the way in science, technology, engineering and math, where I can really focus on that engineering and math towards the end of it. So uh, that's all I have for today. Um, do you have any questions? Thank you, Rachel. That was really awesome. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions, you can certainly put them in the chat or if you want to add them to the Whova app, um, you certainly can. Okay. So then um, let's move on to our next presenter. So our next presenter is Dr. Christopher B. Um, Libatori, um, and he is at Air Force uh, Research Laboratory Sensor Direct Directorate, excuse me, Wright-Patterson Air Force um, as well. Um, and his uh, project title is Low Research Domain Adaptation. Comms check? Yes. Very good. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh -huh. Let me share my screen here. There we go. Um, is that coming through? Yes, sir. We can see your screen. Very good. Well, howdy, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Christopher Liberator. I'm a research computer scientist with the Air Force Research Laboratory Sensors Directorate at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. I actually sit just down the uh, just down the hall from uh, Dr. Rachel Kynard, who you just you just uh, you just heard speak. Um, as, as I said, I just uh, graduated my PhD in computer science from Texas A&M University, and, and if I may take 30 seconds, Texas A&M is a school of traditions, and the Aggies who are in the audience know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to invite everyone. All right, well, sorry, one of the traditions is uh, when a presenter says howdy, everyone who is listening also responds howdy in the affirmative. So I'm going to say howdy again and give you guys the opportunity to unmute your mics and say howdy. So howdy. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for, for humoring me. It feels so much better to be able to present in front of someone as opposed to uh, you know, speaking to a screen. But appreciate you uh, letting me take that little moment there. Again, welcome to my talk. It is called uh, Low Resource Domain Adaptation, but it covers much more than uh, more, many more topics than just my research. I'll also discuss my dissertation how the, and how my dissertation applies to my current research, where I fit in as a scientist in my lab, and how the SMART program has impacted my career. Let's see here. 
So um, very briefly, let's go over what the Sensors Directorate is. Like, so what is the mission of the Air Force Research Laboratory Sensors Directorate? Well, I'm going to crib straight from uh, the mission statement, which is uh, to lead the discovery and development of future capabilities, providing integrated surveillance, or intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR, combat ident identification, and spectrum, war war spectrum warfare effects. In short, we at the Sensors Directorate develop state-of-the-art sensors and algorithms that help the warfighter and decision makers close the kill chain more effectively. So my branch is RYAT, the Decision Sciences branch. Um, and uh, you just heard from Rachel, uh, we specialize in many different things, but I'm gonna focus on one of the, the uh, core technical competencies, competencies we have, which is focusing on automatic target recognition or ATR algorithms. Um, as my background is in computer science, I split my time between two major areas. First, I ensure my branch is computational resources. So I'm the point of contact for the high performance computing system, as well as our first foray into cloud, compu uh, cloud computing workspaces. Um, these resources allow us to interact and partner with the private sector and academia and facilitate fundamental research relevant to our, our uh, interest areas. Besides this, my projects relate to developing ATR algorithms and exploiting sensor resources, which again is the focus of my branch's uh, core research. Um, Broadly speaking, my research is related to the machine learning applications and ATR algorithms. My specialty, which came from my dissertation, is focusing on low resource machine learning methods, either limited training data or limited computational resources. As you just heard from, from Rachel, um, in many of the problems that we have, uh, we would love to have lots and lots of data to have our machines and our, our algorithms make perfect inferences every time when we, make, when we receive information from a sensor. But in practice, we genuinely don't have either lots of information or lots of computing resources. Um, and so let's see here. Uh, my primary research, again, is making inference from these sensors um, by performing a task known as sensor fusion. Uh, sensor fusion is a task of taking information from multiple diverse sensor modalities and making sense of the, uh, making sense of the information that each of them contribute. Um, and to perform sensor fusion, we have to uh, learn how to go from one sensor domain to another. And this is a task known as domain adaptation. Um, you know, for example, it'd be very, very uh, useful to understand how the same object looks um, to a radar as well as a, a visible light or a EO spectrum sensor. So real briefly, here's sort of a uh, uh, roadmap of the re remaining uh, slides of my presentation. First, I'll give you an overview of, of ATR, the, how we're, we're interested in it, and, and especially sensor fusion. And then I'll give you an introduction to my research for my dissertation, um, which again is low resource domain adaptation. And, then, and to do so, I'm gonna teach you about speech, which is what my, my dissertation was interested in, um, and, spe and speech processing, um, and the method that I developed for my dissertation called SABER, or sparse anchor-based representation. Um, then we'll discuss how to go from speech to target recognition um, and a proposed line of, uh, of research that I am uh, currently working on right now, um, the research direction, the potential impacts for it, and the next steps for it. And finally, we'll conclude with a dis discussion about the different collaboration opportunities I've had here at AFRL um, and how SMART has impacted my career. So what is sensor fusion? Well, again, sensor fusion is a task of taking two different modalities of sensors and performing sense making from the combined output of those sensors. Say, for example, we have an aircraft flying overhead and it's observing a vehicle on the ground with two different sensors, say a visible light sensor and a radar. As you can see, these two different domains look vastly different, even though they're looking at exactly the same target. So how do we help a computer understand what's happening in both domains and how to make sense of them? Um, so in these two different domains, was, again, this vehicle looks a lot different. So we need to understand how to fuse this information from these two domains together. Um, we, and in order to do this, we need to understand how to go from one domain to the other and back. In other words, we need to know how to perform um, adaptation or domain adaptation between one sensor domain and another. Um, once we understand how to do this domain adaptation and fuse this information, we can start making sense making. We can perform detections, we can form classifications, we can perform inference. What's so interesting about these, these tasks is they're very, very core machine learning tasks. Machine learning is very interested in understanding what, your, uh, what data means, what data means across different domains, how to understand, go to go, uh, how, to understand um, how to go between those domains and even what is being seen by a sensor or what is in the data. 
Um, again, there are many different ways to accomplish these tasks. Um, and, and as Rachel's brought up before, and, and I mentioned me a minutes ago, um, there are many different ways to do this, but uh, we typically have to have lots and lots of training data um, in order to perform this. Um, but in many cases, uh, we may not have significant amounts of data or computation, um, especially in the field. So how do we use our sensors to perform sense making when we're both starved of data and computation? Well, allow me to shift gears for a quick moment and talk about my dissertation area, which is in an area of speech processing known as voice conversion. And what is voice conversion? Well, voice conversion is the task of taking speech from one speaker and converting it such that the linguistic content is retained from the source speaker, but the identity of the speaker changes to that of a desired target speaker. So a brief little example here, we have President Lincoln on the left saying four score and seven years ago. And suppose we wanted to retain that content four score and seven years, but we wanted to convert it to sound as if Charles de Gaulle was saying it. Well, we need to understand how to separate the linguistic content and, and interpret linguistic content in the source speaker's domain, and then understand how the target speaker will say that exact um, same information. Um, in other words, we need to change the linguistic content from a source domain to a target domain. In my dissertation, I proposed a method called SABER, or sparse anchor-based representation of speech. Under SABER, anchors encoded the identity of a speaker. We had one acoustic anchor per phoneme. Um, and an anchor is a, is a canonical way that a speaker makes that particular sound in speech. And um, it, excuse me, um, it represented speech as a, a linear combination or a set of weights of, uh, of, of an utterance uh, relative to these anchors. Um, these weights were estimated via sparse regression. Um, and so an, uh, the, the content, of an utterance, content of an utterance was encoded relative to these anchors. Um, I perform voice conversion by collecting anchors from a source speaker and a target speaker and, co and encoding how the speaker formed different sounds in English. Then I could use the weights from the source speaker, which was linguistic content, and the acres for the target speaker to synthesize how the target speaker formed the same content as the source speaker. So this is all fine and dandy, but the big question remains, how do we adapt Saber to do sensor fusion? Well, sensor fusion requires us to understand how to go between a source domain and a target domain. If the source and target speakers then become, uh, we can then cast this as the source and target speakers becoming source and target domains. And then we can learn how to go from a source sensor domain to a sense, uh, source uh, excuse me, a target sensor domain. Anchors become items of interests and weights become detections of such items. So let's go into a little more depth here, talk about how we actually use Saber to do the sensor fusion task. Um, again, whole idea is we wanna be able to convert from acoustic anchors to representing um, objects of interest. So in the speech domain, we have this collection of anchors where each anchor represents a different uh, 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 phoneme or phonetic information. Um, again, phoneme is what I was using. And we have same linguistic content represented between the source speaker and the target speaker, representing how each speaker forms those particular sounds. Well, if we wanted to convert this to an ATR domain, uh, say detection or classification task, well, we could imagine the anchors as not being source and target speakers, but source, source and target sensors or two different sensors. And all they have to do is have representations of the same exact um, objects, of, objects of interest, um, but in their two different respective domains. So on the right here, we have an example of say an EO or a visible light sensor and a SAR or a, a radar sensor. And they're different representations for different things that we might find interesting. And we can use the Sabre method to extract the content in both domains from the, the uh, sensor, uh, from sample sensor um, imagery of interest. Um, and then we can fuse the results of that information to, to, uh, to learn about what's actually in a scene. So as an illustration here, let's say we have the, the slice of a uh, picture from the, the visible light sensor on the top there. We have a radar image on the bottom there. Well, we can use the Sabre method um, combined with the, the ATR representation of the Sabre anchors, and we can get an, a sense, uh, an encoding of the information in each one of those images. And we do a little extra work on top of that. We use information from the, from the EO weights or from the SAR weights, and we can make detections and classifications. We can do tracking. We can do sense making on that information. 
So with the research impact of this, of my proposed line of research will be a proven low resource method for detection classification and, and sensor fusion. Um, what's really important about uh, the SABRE method is it can be trained on extremely few examples. Um, so the models themselves are about two orders of magnitude, uh, more compact than comparable models in speech. Um, and moreover, uh, it needs um, even more, uh, even fewer orders of magnitude, less training information. So for example, um, many of your state of the art um, uh, speech synthesis uh, algorithms like you hear for Siri or something like that are trained on literally hundreds of hours of speech. Um, I can, uh, I, excuse me, the Sabre method can produce um, uh, realistic, um, fairly high quality speech um, synthesis with just one minute of data as opposed to hundreds of hours. Um, and even more so, the algorithms themselves are very, very simple and can be run in a very limited resource computing environment. So you don't need a, a GPU, you don't need a huge amount of computing resources to do inference on it. Um, and there is a wealth of paper, uh, papers, excuse me, there's a wealth of research related to the method um, that can be extended and applied to ATR, not just speech. So the next steps for this research, well, um, I have uh, some small amount of funding uh, to collaborate with a graduate student and get the very first version of this, uh, these algorithms um, implemented and evaluated um, this fall. And I just submitted a Smart Seed Grant funding, funding proposal to research um, not just this method for low resource um, domain adaptation uh, techniques, um, but uh, to look at um, other ways of extending existing algorithms, more complex algorithms, and bringing them to more simple domains. Um, again, I just submitted a Smart Seed Grant uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so, uh, as part of my research, I actually have a lot of opportunities for collaboration. Um, Rachel mentioned, um, we have, uh, we've already gone on a number of TDYs together, um, uh, to several directorates, um, on projects that we're on. Um, we've both gone to the information directorate in RI, Rome, New York, and, uh, space vehicles directorate, um, RV at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We also have a collaboration is with the, uh, the intelligence community. Um, uh, they're, they're very interested in target recognition algorithms. Um, and additionally, we have lots of external collaborators. Um, one of the big ones I want to mention is the Autonomy Technology Research Center at Wright State University. What's interesting about this, this, uh, this, this center is it's uh, a joint collaboration between Wright State and AFRL um, RY, it's the Sensors Director. It's been around for um, a number of years. Um, and when I was doing my smart internships um, uh, on, on base, I was embedded in the ATR Center, not as an officially an ATR Center intern, but as a, uh, just a, a smart intern who was working on the same project as the ATR Center interns were. And what's fascinating about that is now that I am an AR for LL, uh, uh, employee, I am a mentor for the ATR Center this summer, and I have three interns of my own, and we're working on research. Um, so it's an interesting sort of, um, it's interesting seeing, seeing this from the opposite side of being a mentor um, when I had been an intern. Uh, it gives you a different perspective and a different appreciation for it. Finally, I want to like I want to close and talk about how SMART has had an impact on my career. Well, um, SMART Scholarship for Service program has had an incredible impact on my career. Um, you've heard from a number of people. Um, it allows you to pursue your studies. Um, in uh, your research in graduate school without distraction, such as a TA or RA duties. Um, my very first year of graduate school, I had a, a TA a TA ship, and that was um, it was a quite a time sink. And I'm I, I really could not imagine spending that much time not on my research um, in order to finish. Um, so that's obviously a huge a huge help. Um, the internships exposed me to the culture now, uh, which I now work, um, both a civil servant and military context. Um, I wasn't prepared uh, quite for how much, how different, but not in a, a negative way at all, um, both uh, civil service and uh, uh, you know, working for AFRL would be versus say academia. Um, but being exposed to that culture um, and the, the internships uh, made that a lot easier. Um, my very, very first summer, I got my first uh, uh, you know, CAC card. I understood how to you know, get around a military base. Like those were things that, uh, you, that, the, that the SMART program like, helped facilitate. Um, and uh, finally, I have to say the work we do is just really, really cool. How many computer science PhDs get to say that they've flown in an F-15 simulator or been on the flight deck of a C-17? Um, not, to, not to make too much light of it, but the work is really, really neat. And you have a lot of extremely cool opportunities um, that can't be underscored enough. Um, but most importantly, and I want to highlight this because uh, it, it uh, is important to me. Um, the SMART scholarship 
program has given me an opportunity to serve my country, both as a, both as a civil servant and a scientist. Um, the placement by my sponsoring facility also provided focus, certainty, and purpose to my studies. Um, so I, I feel like it's something that really also needs to be underscored. Um, uh, if you're interested, uh, before I went to graduate school, um, DOD was not on my radar. Uh, civil service was not on my radar. I did not know that I... Uh, these opportunities existed. Um, so when it came up and, and I got um, accepted into the SMART program, it was uh, uh, very you know, fulfilling on an, another level um, to be able to serve my country in this way. Um, in any case, that's the end of my remarks. Thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you. We do have, um, it looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, in the chat, but we're kind of um, coming up against time. So um, if you don't mind, you can go ahead and respond to those um, in the chat. I will, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we will move on um, to our final presenter for this afternoon session. Um, and the final presenter is Dr. Darlene Perez-Lavin. Um, she is at Naval Information Warfare Center Atlantic in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and her project title is Decision Making with Optimization Models. All right, Darlene, oh, we can see your screen, excellent. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I wanna take, uh, take the time to thank you for coming to my talk. And also I feel so welcome as I just <laughs> closing this session from everyone that's in Dayton, Ohio. I have um, one of my graduate student friends actually works for AFRL out there. So it's kind of exciting to hear about the type of work he does at that lab. <clears throat> so, to give you a little bit about myself is I work on decision-making models that use optimization. I have a PhD in pure mathematics. So it was great to hear that there's another pure mathematics person within the DOD. I just love my math people. So we understand each other. <laughs> From University of Kentucky, I graduated in May, 2021. And I work for the Naval Information Warfare Center Atlantic who uh, based out of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, so the mission statement for NIWIC Lamp is we serve our nation by delivering information warfare solutions that provide, that protect our national security. Our vision is to win the information war. So we work on projects, pro, uh, programs such as the Office of Naval Research and other labs, for example, NIWIC PAC, uh, and MIT Lincoln Labs to continue to advance technology in the direction appointed by the Department of Defense. So in the science and technology department, which is the department I work in, we stay, we try to stay up to date on current research that facilitates our customers' needs, such as Endopaycom and MorphoPack, and among others. Those are the, just the clients that I currently work with. <clears throat> and we aim to provide a better support for the warfighter at their fingertips. We work with our customers to understand their current problems and aim to help them become more efficient by advancing their technological capabilities. This is why I took a job with the DOD. I really like serving towards this cause. So a little bit about what I'm working on, working on decision-making models that help with strategic applications and receipt that receive existing data. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a graphic from a reinforcement model that provides path and applies effects when necessary, which we'll talk about in the next scenario. And the exciting thing about this model is it incorporates cooperative and competitive game theory into these models with these two ships and as we integrate with that. The one on the right is we provide an operational reach model for logistics resupply. Operational reach is necessary to maintain battle endurance. We plan to simulate uh, logistics resupply and posturing to understand and extend those resupply lines. So the graphic on the right, you can see that we have a supply ship at the center of the circle with the yellow color, and we extend it towards we have a network if they're connected, if those two radius circles intersect. And then you'll also see that like some of these ships are kind of on their own and do not have the capability of being resupplied. These are the types of visualizations we want to supply to the commanders and um, with including live feeds. So to jump into this cooperative and competitive game theory, the scenario is we have a SAG 
And the plan is to detach to DDGs for independent missions. Now, if you're not familiar with the acronym SAG, it's just, you can think about it as a collection of ships. It's a very identified collection of ships and DDGs are your destroyers, which you can actually Google. And all of a sudden they're out at this open sea area and an enemy drone comes into the picture. So how, to, how would the SAG and the DGG teams best address the current threat? And our goal is to build an algorithm that will provide the best course of action and provide moments for human in the loop decision-making steps. So this problem kind of sounds a little trivial, but when you <laughs> remove communications and you have these open sea problems and you don't, one player doesn't know where the other player is, how do these ships should interact where they're really optimizing to mitigate the situation and not de being detected. So as you know, I'm a mathematician. I love my equations, uh, <laughs> especially as a number theorist. So how does this game theory piece come into play? So we have cooperative and competitive play and what we're, we're utilizing are these things called cocoa values. So the cocoa, value, the cocoa values takes into payoff matrices from player one and player two. And all these payoff matrices do is they contain information of like, what is your, what is your score after you do these actions? And the reason we have competitive and cooperative is the cooperative side is this max max function. So you're utilizing the best possible action for player one and player two, and it's averaging this out and also including this min max function that you take my bet. If I'm player one from player one's perspective, I want to do the best thing for me while not necessarily helping out player two. So <laughs> these cocoa values are run in a Q value update within reinforcement learning. And I've shown the update equation listed below. So if you're not familiar with reinforcement learning, these algorithms basically run multiple, multiple iterations, like thousands and thousands of times. And what they do is at each given step, you actually realize the, the model is like learning by making a whole bunch of mistakes. Like, and then you train it and now it's like, yes, it like knows how to win this game that you've created. And what you do is you send it into this new world and you say, now do your best. And it pulls from probability distributions of the previously trained things. And it like basically gives you a solution of how to best mitigate this gameplay in these types of scenarios. The exciting thing about this project, there is another group at Nywick Lamp that's working on hardware for this type of device, along with MIT Lincoln Labs, and they are funded by the Office of Naval Research. And the important thing is, is as they build this hardware to to take in all of this live data information that's coming in from these ships or wherever the information might be coming from, we are the test bed for their hardware. So our role in this project is to build software that allows us to receive this information, provide commanders with, with recommendations and make and really test to make sure that we're supplying what it should need. So I know the scenario I presented was slightly trivial, but we have to start somewhere. And by building a, a small step framework, we can actually test how well our algorithms are doing. So the Naval Research Labs piece is kind of informing us who, how these things function and they have uh, research in this area that actually shows that works on very specific elements of this, this group. So the next piece, is the operational reach model. Understanding logistics pathways that provide a network for resupply is a well-studied problem. Adding naval comments, restrictions, adds levels of complexity due to the number of variables. We look to define operational reach to understand a network, to suggest additional support, and provide a visual way to look at supply demands and needs. So again, I posted this graphic that we had in the previous slide. And so each ship has each ship and combat asset has a capability radius. So in this diagram, you only have one supplier ship. I was told they're like floating warehouses. It's pretty great. Um, so their demand is actually quite bigger. And while the combat assets either have absolutely no, no capability radiuses because they don't have mobility assets dedicated to that, those locations, or they have reasonable capability radiuses as they are demanded to 
meet the requirements within a particular zone. So we don't really want them moving out of that zone. We need to bring supplies to them. So from this diagram, we want to build in what we call an operational network. So you're connected in this network if two circles are intersecting and we just kind of create this graph of a network graph. And we have operational reach if everyone within every combat asset is connected to some supply line. So in the diagram on the right, you will notice that we do not have operational reach. We do have two combat assets that cannot be resupplied. And the problem with this is now we have a visual way to show that, hey, do we need to readjust these supply lines, readjust the positionings of these floating warehouses, as I earlier stated, or do we need to essentially give this warehouse more support for, to meet the demands of the current combat assets. And these are questions that commanders want responses to in a reasonable time frame. So there's multiple layers of this project and uh, I'm happy to dive into them as this takes in uh, graph theory and as well as uh, optimization models. And we plan to use reinforcement learning models to kind of course out the steps of what it means to do those resupply lines. So the last thing I do want to touch base on, and it is really great to hear that we all have very positive, similar experiences with the, the SMART program. As, I, as a mathematician, you have a lot of teaching demands as a graduate student, which I enjoyed, similar to some other PhDs. I did start the SMART Fellowship relatively late. I also have a background in industrial engineering management, and I worked in construction management for five years before attending a higher education. So my, I have a pretty diverse background. <clears throat> and the SMART Fellowship really allowed me to dive into my research as well as explore other areas. So when you take a research position at a lab, you, at least for me as a number theorist, I. I can focus things on what my dissertation was focused on, but also you'll be asked to jump into different, different projects that have different requirements. For example, I'm learning about these game theory components, and that is something that I'm, you know, I really, really enjoy. Now, my dissertation work correlates a lot with the optimization, writing algorithms for optimization models. Um, but learning the game theory piece is something I had to pick up for these projects. So being okay to work outside of your comfort zone is really, really important. And the funding allowed to give me time to do that. So another really crucial thing was doing these internships. I got to know my people at Nywick Glant, as Layla like to say, and kind of network and see what the lab was about and know which projects I wanted to work on and know the type of people that ran those types of projects. And it was really, really crucial to making me feel more at home at Nightway Plant by supplying these internships. Now, I, <laughs> I did lose out on one opportunity, so I only got to go to Charleston once because, you know, COVID times, but that's okay. It's, I still made the best of it. So some exciting things, as everyone has mentioned, I've been out to Hawaii, California. My travel schedule is crazy, but very exciting. I took this position because I really like working with the warfighter. I'm in meetings with Marines once at least once a week. And that makes me very excited to be connected with them and working with them and really helping them achieve what they uh, need to achieve. Another opportunity that's really great is a the mentoring. So we are provided with mentors. You kind of get to know your lab a little bit better. And one caveat is you have to learn to make the most of it. So if you are part of this program and you have questions, don't think any question is that small reach out, ask your questions. That's what mentors are there for. So try to build that mentoring pool. And uh, so you always have someone to lean on given your, given your question. So thank you again for your time. And thanks for the organizers who put this together. I really appreciate the opportunity to give you some insight about my research. And Charleston is beautiful. So <laughs> those are my pictures. That's my dog. You can walk your dog on the beach pretty much every day. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Darlene. And your dog is really cute. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
So thank you um, to our four awesome presenters. Thank you, Julia, Rachel, Christopher, and Darlene. Um, I will turn it over to um, Brandon for some closing remarks. Thanks, Monica. Thanks to uh, all of our speakers here in the last session. Really interesting uh, stuff. and appreciated um, you sharing your work with us. Um, we do have some sessions uh, this afternoon. The scholar speakers are uh, going to be headed to their workshop. Um, for those of you who are new to, to the SMART program, if you didn't catch the SMART 101 uh, brief yesterday, that will be starting right about now. You can go and uh, hear a little bit more about the SMART program, ask some questions ahead of the application portal opening on the 1st of August. And then, of course, for our sponsoring facility, POCs, um, <clears throat> And personnel, we have uh, our workshop at 2.30 again. We'll, we'll be diving in uh, to some new topics. Had a really great discussion yesterday. Looking forward to that again. Um, since this will be the last time that we will all be together. Um, oh, and uh, so, sorry. Uh, and one more thing for the, the scholar speakers. We will have our uh, roundtable tomorrow at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time. Um, looking forward to that. That will be an opportunity for the scholar speakers to get together and we'll have some just some informal discussion. Um, we've got a couple prompts for you just to, to hear a little bit more about your smart scholar experience. I want all of you to bring um, your ideas and um, uh, your thoughts on uh, how to make the program better um, or what things have been really, really great that you want to see us to, to keep doing more of. Um, the roundtable will be a great way to have uh, some uh, informal one-on-one -on -one discussion. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that with the scholar speakers tomorrow. Um, since this will be the last time that we'll all be together here, I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you for your flexibility again. Um, again, I share in your disappointment that we weren't able to do a lot of this face-to-face uh, -face like we had planned, um, but I appreciate everyone being flexible. Thank you uh, publicly to the SMART team and the SMART staff um, for the Herculean effort in, in getting us all um, online and, and set up. Um, I think that uh, these sessions that we've had, uh, both the technical talks um, the scholar panels uh, or the scholar panel that we had this morning, um, some of the remarks from uh, Dr. Nair yesterday morning have been um, really insightful. Um, and I hope you all have found some, some benefit in participating with us. If you're not already um, subscribed to the SMART mailing list, uh, please do so. Go to the website, www.smartscholarship.org, uh, and click uh, subscribe at the top, particularly for those of you who are looking to apply to the SMART program in the future. Um, our application portal opens one August, so just a couple weeks, um, and we will be having a series of events this fall, um, information sessions, uh, help sessions, um, all sorts of, of great events, both in person at academic institutions um, and virtually um, to uh, help uh, future smart scholars um, get their applications completed uh, ahead of the December 1st deadline. Um, I hope you've all had a, an opportunity to learn a little bit more about the program, how it works. Uh, I hope you've had uh, an opportunity to hear directly from scholars and see the great work that they're doing. Uh, and I'm hoping that um, depending on uh, your role, you've been finding some value uh, in uh, these individual workshops um, uh, as, as we all kind of work together uh, to make sure that the SMART program um, is, is delivering on its mission to uh, deliver the, the, the next generation of STEM talent to the DOD. Um, any questions um, about uh, SMART, uh, you can direct to outreach at smartscholarship.org. Uh, of course, we'll still be on the Whova platform if you want to uh, engage there uh, for the rest of the day. Um, otherwise, thank you all again uh, for joining us uh, these two days, and I hope to see some of you in the sessions this afternoon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>